Continuamos. Siguiente conferenciante, el señor Esther Sainty, es ciudadano británico, educado en Westminster School, Westminster School, Minster School la Sociedad Dante Alighieri, en Roma, y en la Facultad de Derecho de Londres, miembro de la Honorable Sociedad del Templo Interior. Él es distribuidor de arte con galería en Londres y anteriormente en Nueva York. Miembro de la Fundación Europea de la Feria de Bellas Artes y es miembro de la Society of London Art Delays. Autor de numerosos artículos sobre historia del arte, órdenes de caballería, nobleza y realeza, incluidas numerosas publicaciones sobre la Orden Constantiniana de San Jorge, su historia, estatutos, orígenes de la disputa sobre la sucesión a la jefatura de la Casa Real de las dos Sicilias y sobre la insigne Orden del Toisón de Oro y varias obras sobre arte y pintura. Él es vicegran canciller de la Sacra y Militar Orden Constantiniana de San Jorge, miembro asesor permanente del Comité de las Órdenes Falsas de la Soberana Orden Militar de Malta y Alianza de Órdenes de San Juan, y es miembro de la Comisión Internacional de las Órdenes de Caballería. Buen día, Juan. Thank you. Thank you very much, and thank you for inviting me to speak on a controversial topic, which is always more fun, I find. But this, this is, at least I like to speak on controversial to uh, topics. My, the subject of my talk is noble titles granted by royal pretenders, genuine or false, legitimate or worthless vanities. Those, like many of us gathered here today, who have an interest in the history and development of the structure of the European nobility, may have observed the recent appearance of ever-expanding number of newly minted nobles sporting high-ranking titles. The holders of these, both men and far less often women, do not pretend to claim these honours through a purported connection to some historic or invented ancestor, although the numbers of the latter are legion, but rather to be the fortunate beneficiaries of the generosity of claimants to the headship of former reigning royal houses. There are two particular curiosities of many of these awards. Firstly, that the most munificent source of these honours may be the claimant to the throne of a country that never had a nobiliary tradition on the Western European model, and at least one case was never a truly sovereign monarchy. Secondly, that those who purport to hold high-sounding high offices administering the distribution of these honours have no obvious connection to the royal dynasty or to the country of origin of the Fons Honorum. <coughs> While Georgian dukes and Vietnamese marquises seem to have sprung from hitherto virgin soil, the heirs of most of these great European royal houses, which just over a century ago maintained active nobiliary jurisdictions, have wholly abandoned this aspect was what, of what was once a significant aspect of the royal prerogative. In examining the question, I have concluded there are several criteria that determine the worth of such titles. And by worth, hope that opens up. And by worth, I mean the extent to which they truly bring honor to the recipient, conferring some kind of public recognition of his or her achievements and social position. In examining the titles conferred by exiled claimants, one must also consider the recognition of those titles conferred by temporary de facto regnant rulers, whether usurpers or revolutionaries. The factors I would propose for consideration in evaluating these titles are uh, on the screen, uh, hopefully. Uh, this, I'm going to get rid of that. Uh, yeah, I, didn't, I did it wrong. Yeah, I put the wrong thing in there, didn't I? Sorry. Um, I'll continue to read. The likelihood of the restoration of the Grantors dynasty as ruling monarchs was de facto government by a usurper or externally imposed sovereign sufficient to legalize the awards of titles when that government was replaced by the legitimate dynasty. The personal status of the grantor and whether his or her whether his or her claim is generally regarded as the legitimate claimant to be head of that dynasty. Did the country have a nobility system when the dynasty was reigning? whether the grantor, if he or she still had been reigning, would have had the authority to make such an award without the consent of the government or a particular minister. If there was a regulation requiring the assent of a third party, 
had the grantor taken steps to ensure that there was such a confirmatory authority? And does the award confirm, conform to the nobility system of the country prevailing when the dynasty was, railing, well, was reigning? Is there an extant Department of State or authoritative private organization regulating the nobility of that country that would include these new creations in its registers? And do the titles granted parallel in status equivalent titles granted prior to the deposition of the dynasty? Not all these conditions may be met. And in the case of the second, the possibility of the dynasty being restored, this is the least likely in the present world. Yet it is the one condition that would probably ensure the public recognition of these titles. Without official recognition, what is their worth? The desire for public recognition of virtue through elevation to higher social position is not a novel development. Historically, this recognition was conferred by ruling sovereigns as a reward for services, along with an expectation of loyalty and support. I do not propose to go into details about the history or development of the present nobility systems in Europe, but suffice it to say that there are only three European states which still confer noble titles on their citizens, the United Kingdom, Belgium and Spain, with no titles being conferred by the latter during the present reign. The present European monarchies each retain the motu proprio prerogative of granting titles, but aside from the British, Belgian and Spanish, only to members of their own families. Uniquely, and perhaps anachronistically, the United Kingdom's Upper House of Parliament is composed exclusively of titled nobles. But while the vast majority of the members are there by right of having been granted life baronies, always on recommendation of the Prime Minister, there are still a handful of Anglican bishops, the Lord's Spiritual, among the peers, and 90 who are elected for life from among the hereditary peers, excluding the Irish peers, or who hold hereditary offices of state. The King of the Belgians grants both hereditary and life titles, but these carry no privileges. And while Spanish titles, other than those conferred on members of the royal family, are almost always hereditary, King Juan Carlos only conferred them rarely. In each of the European monarchies with officially recognized nobilities, it is possible to ascertain the legitimacy of the claims to noble titles by reference to regular publications, which record the names of the present holders of officially or privately recognized titles sometimes with the genealogies of their families. But what do noble titles mean today? There are no legal privileges, aside from those still pertaining to the British peerage, and the constitutions of every European state emphasize the equality of its citizens. The desire for honors, however, is well-rooted in all relatively developed societies, and we know from the history of chivalric institutions that there were self-styled orders of chivalry in Europe from the early 16th century several of them originating with putatives from the remnants of the Byzantine Empire. Some might be astonished to learn that the newly appointed Maltese chief herald claims not one, but two titles of count granted him by purported pretenders to the Byzantine throne. There are actually too many pretenders to non-existent thrones or who claim spurious descent from ancient but extinct dynasties to mention here. So I've limited my comments to the conferrals by genuine descendants of sometimes royal houses, sometime royal houses, and so will not further embarrass Mr. Gauci, the Maltese Herald, in his absence. This is one of the Dutch princes. Uh, the question of who can grant a legitimate honor is the first issue that I shall attempt to address, while the second is that of recognition, to which the former is inevitably linked. The first country where the question of the legitimacy of honors granted by an exile claimant arose was my own. Great Britain. The execution of King Charles I after a show trial on the 30th of January 1649 was an astonishing event in European history. It represented the first occasion when a crowned and anointed sovereign was deposed by people claiming to represent the nation and has shaped the development of British history ever since. Lord Protector Cromwell proved to be a nepotistic despot while neither of his sons exhibited any particular talents, the older, Richard, was appointed his heir and successor, while his then 26-year-old younger son, Henry, was named Lord Deputy of Ireland. During their period in power, all three <coughs> conferred knighthoods, while, while, Lord, oh, Sorry. Wrong here. while Lord Protector Cromwell himself conferred at least 11 baronetcies and three peerages. <coughs> 
despite the Cromwellian regime being the sole de facto power in England, Wales, and Ireland for most of the period from 1650 to 60, and part of that time in Scotland, this exercise of the prerogative powers was never recognized after the restoration of 1660. It would have been unwise indeed for anyone to use or claim a Cromwellian title. And while there may be heirs to some of these titles, none have ever been so foolish as to revive their use. Meanwhile, Charles II, who became titular king upon the execution of his father and a fugitive in Scotland and England before leaving for exile in, in the Netherlands, created 19 titles in the peerages of England, Scotland and Ireland, beginning with the English barony of Wooden on the 31st of August 1650. While these titles were created by letters patent, in the absence of the Great Seal, there were only short periods in the interregnum when there was a Lord Keeper of the Seal, they could not be made with all the formalities required. But nonetheless, immediately following the Restoration in 1660, these titles were added to the role of the peerage. Crucially, they were enrolled with the date of the original creation, when the monarchy only existed de jure, rather than the date of the restored monarchy. This was the first time that the exercise of the prerogative by an exiled sovereign was recognized in public law. Following the Second Revolution of 1688, when James II was overthrown for his adhesion to the Catholic <coughs> faith by his Protestant son-in-law, William of Orange, the former king, his son, the titular James III, and grandson, the titular Charles III, continued to create peerages and baronetcies and award the orders of the Garter and Thistle, the latter founded by James himself when reigning. These creations of peerages and awards of orders have remained unrecognized by the Crown, however, and are not acknowledged in British society. Nonetheless, the example of the 1660 Restoration would indicate that had either the 1715 or 1745 Jacobite uprisings been successful, these peerages would have been recognized and added to the peerage role. And I would say what we don't know is what would have happened to the peerages granted by the uh, intervening monarchs um, who had deposed the Stuarts. <coughs> Some of the British recipients of these titles entered the service of other European monarchs, and almost without exception, the titles they were given by the Stuart pretenders were recognized in some form by their new masters. That was not true, however, of British titles conferred on non-British recipients, like the title of Duke of St. Andrews conferred on Don Jose de Rosas, great-grandfather of, great of the wife of Infante Don Luis Antonio, which was not recognized by the Spanish kings. In contrast, the dukedom of Berwick, conferred by James II on his illegitimate son before his deposition and wrongly thought to have been attainted in England, was recognized as a Spanish dukedom for the great Marshal Duke of Berwick. Certifications of nobility were also issued by the Stuart claimants, despite being an alien practice for which there was no need in England, there being no privileged nobility other than the peerage. But these were routinely accepted by nobility authorities in France, Spain, Italy, and the Empire. The grant of titles by exiled princes <coughs> was much rarer than the conferral of orders. The Stuart claimants were rather exceptional in this regard. King Louis XVIII in exile in 1801, in addition to awarding all the royal orders, merely regulated the arms of his faithful friend Antoine de Béziard, Marquis d'Avray, creating him Duc d'Avray, following the restoration, but did not confer any titles during his exile. Napoleon, once restored during the 100 days, made a handful of conferrals, but unlike all his titles created before his first deposition, which were all accepted by the Restoration monarchy as an essential gesture of reconciliation, these later awards remained unrecognized until the Second Empire. The titles conferred by Joseph Napoleon in Spain were ignored by the restored Bourbons, although two Mura titles were recognized by King Ferdinando of the Two Sicilies in the 1850s, and the Savoy monarchy also acknowledged two Mura titles. One, the baronial title of former Italian president Oscar Scalfaro, was recognized in 1899. Spain, however, did recognize the titles conferred by the provisional government of 1869 <coughs> to 70 and by King Amadeo of Savoy during his brief reign from 1870 to 73, although initially the crown refused to acknowledge Amadeo's additions to the Golden Fleece, but it was forced to do so for political reasons some years later. <coughs> 
King Francesco II of the Two Sisters conferred a number of noble titles following the incorporation of his kingdom into the Savoy Kingdom of Italy, both while at Gaeta, then in exile in Rome, and in the years leading to his death. He maintained court appointments and had a substantial and devoted following in his homeland, with Italian unification not wholly accepted until the First World War, the great unifying force in modern Italian history. Only one of his creations was ever acknowledged in Italy, however, that of Count of Rocca Guglielma, conferred on the descendants of a morganatic marriage of a junior prince of his house. But this was in re reality a new creation by King Umberto I. Francesco's half-brother and heir, the Count of Gazerta, while also appointing a handful of court officials in the early years following his succession, only seems to have created two titles, that of Prince of Carrara for his long-time major-domo, Raffaello de Barbarino, and Count of Santa Agatha for his friend and chamberlain, Pietro de Vial. These titles were, of course, acknowledged by his adherents, but were never recognized officially. The last king of Italy, Umberto II, never abdicated as king and was accompanied into exile in 1946 by the minister of the royal household, Marquis Falcone Lucifero, who was required to countersign any confirmations, convalidations, or creations of noble titles for them to be legally valid. In addition to the titles created by King Umberto in the brief period between his father's abdication and his departure for exile, the king made some 278 entirely new concessions ranging from untitled noble through prince, along with the concession of extinct titles to collaterals between 1950 and his death in 1983. He also made a number of authorizations, which in several cases may be regarded as new creations, the claims of some of the recipients being somewhat uncertain. Convalidations, which may have included the recognition of extinct titles granted to collateral branches, renovations, assents, and authorizations of transmission through the female line. While the Italian Republic does not recognize any noble titles, whether created before or after 1946, and the new predicati created by King Umberto cannot be introduced legally into the name, the Sovereign Military Order of Malta has recognized King Umberto's creations where appropriate. Indeed, in a formal negotiation between the Sovereign Military Order and the Italian Republic, the agreement signed by the then Grand Chancellor of the Order, Carlo Marullo, included the use of his title of Prince of Casal Nuovo, given by King Umberto in 1977, <coughs> despite Marullo being an Italian citizen and an Italian law excluding the recognition of noble titles. But this was rather an astonishing, because he was an Italian citizen, never a citizen of the Order of Malta, even though Grand Chancellor. So the use of his title was somewhat unexpected. It was also on his diploma as a Grand Cross of the Order of uh, Merit of the Italian Republic. The most recent occasion when titles awarded by claimants in exile were later recognized was when General Franco, by a law dated 4th of May 1948, elaborated one month later, decreed that the 171 titles created by the Carlist claimants in exile between 1833 and 1931 could be recognized and authorized for their present heirs. This exceptional provision did not require a particular format for the creation of such titles, some of which were made in personal letters from the claimant to the recipient, and in one case on a postcard. And despite the exiled Carlist claimants only briefly maintaining the shadow of a government in exile, unlike, for example, the Jacobite claimants and Francesco II of the Two Sicilies. A curious aspect of this was that the end date was 1931 and not 1936, the date of death of the last Carlist claimant. Franco thereby implicitly acknowledging that King Alfonso XIII's departure from Spain ended both the constitutionalist and Carlist claim to the monarchy. This decision was made as a gesture of national reconciliation, but one might wonder what, if any consideration, might have been given to awards by King Alfonso and Don Juan had they granted any titles in exile, which neither did. The successive claimants to the Russian imperial throne, Grand Dukes Kirill and Vladimir, and the Grand Duchess Maria, have each conferred titles on close associates and advisors, with at least one princely title recognized by the Order of Malta, which the recipient served as an ambassador to Spain and several Latin American countries. The majority of these titles were baronial, and unfortunately no registry of these titles has ever been published. The present phenomena of newly invented nobilities embraces the claimants to two thrones which never historically had Western European-style nobilities, 
The precedent for such grants was set by two former Balkan sovereigns, Montenegro and Yugoslavia. Prince Nicholas of Montenegro proclaimed his country a kingdom in 1910, but was forced into exile when Austro-Hungarian forces occupied his country in 1916. In 1918, a popular assembly manipulated by pro-Serbian interests voted for unification with Serbia. But it was not until his death in 1921 that all the powers recognized the union with Montenegro into what had become the Kingdom of the Serbs, Croats and Slovenes, later renamed Yugoslavia. Montenegro had had a small noble class of hereditary nobles, of whom 14 had the rank of Serdar, perhaps the equivalent of Count. But King Nicholas, once in exile, but being strapped for cash, seems to have been persuaded to begin the practice of conferring titles of all ranks in return for contributions to his budget. While Montenegrin titles were quite widely conferred in the 1920s, the majority were granted by diplomas backdated to before the death of King Nicholas, none of the recipients having any connection to Montenegro. A Belgian family claiming the title of prince has managed to be included in the modern so-called Almanac de Gotha, a private publication noted more for the apparent ignorance of its editors than its scholarly credentials. <coughs> the relative success of the Montenegrins may have inspired those who persuaded the exiled King Peter II of Yugoslavia to confer various titles and institute a class of baronets based on the British model. While the Yugoslav constitution specifically forbade the king from granting any titles of nobility, this was no deterrent to those who sought such honours. Uh, on the uh, screen there, you will see an institution that, contrary to my, what I've just said, claims that he had every right to do so, and that an earlier version of the ICOC, then run by a highly dubious individual named Robert Gare, uh, had questioned King Peter's, and they're denouncing him for doing so, uh, King Peter's awards. Um, perhaps the most notorious recipient, recipient, but certainly not the only one, was the late Thomas Foran, who had acquired a San Marino barony and whose invented history as the man who rescued King Peter from the Nazi invasion, was exposed as a fraud when it was demonstrated that he was actually a schoolboy in Connecticut when his purported heroics occurred. In any case, sometime in the late 1950s, he persuaded King Peter to make him a duke, backdating the diploma to the three weeks between the king's succession following the deposition of the regent and his hasty exile in the face of the German invasion. The title Foran chose, Duke of Sankt Bar, had been selected when he looked at a map of Yugoslavia and found on the Croatian coast a town named S. Period, Bar. This actually stood for Stari Bar, which translates as Bar Harbor, the S representing the word Stari and not Saint. Following King Peter's death, his only son and heir made it clear that the Yugoslav royal constitution neither permitted the grant or recognition of such titles, nor royal protection for the Fourth Order of St. John, which his late father had been persuaded to support, or for organizations like this one you see mentioned on the board. The awards by King Nicholas and King Peter II may have been the inspiration for the titles granted by Prince David Bagration, the second son of the late Prince Jorge Bagration. Jorge's father, Iracli had proclaimed himself Georgian claimant as head of the Mukrani branch of the ancient Bagration house in the belief that the last reigning line was extinct. In, re in reality, the heirs of this latter had survived the revolution, although there has been some recent controversy of the validity of their marriages. And the head of this line also claims the headship of the Georgian royal house. Both claimants distribute orders of recent vintage with Prince David's Order of the Georgian Eagle and the seamless tunic of our Lord Jesus Christ, quite a long name, supposedly first founded at the turn of the 13th century, being awarded in the rank of Gra Grand Cross many more times. In fact, I've estimated 20 times as many Grand Crosses as there are knights. The officers of this order, assigned from David's brothers and one gentleman of presumed Georgian origin, are rather surprisingly Spaniards, and three of them have received titles from Prince David, the order's Grand Chancellor being created a Duke, Marquis, and Baron, with the two others given the title of Viscount. Aside from asking why a Georgian order is run by Spaniards, one might question by what authority are titles awarded <coughs> whose designations have no authority whatsoever with Georgia or its history in ranks that never existed during the Georgian monarchy. These are not the only newly invented members of the neo-Georgian nobility. 
a respected fit figure in the city of London, Mr. William Charmley, uh, past master of the Draper's Company, has been created Duke of Amer, a place not in Georgia but in England, and subsequently received further titles of Marquis, Count, and Baron. The extent of Georgian generosity or the precise qualification for receipt of a title is uncertain, since no reputable nobiliary almanac is likely to want to include them, but it seems the practice continues <coughs> unabated. Even more questionable, perhaps, are the titles given by the late Kige King Kigeli of Rwanda. Rwanda was a Belgian colony, and its kings were not treated as heads of a sovereign state. The various Rwandan orders are of fairly recent origin, and of course, there was never an hereditary title nobility on the European model in Rwanda, or in any other sub-Saharan African country. <coughs> Yet the late king was misled by some enterprising individuals who had no connection whatsoever with Rwanda to institute a titled nobility. Not, of course, to reward those Rwandans who had served their benighted country or their king, but predominantly for British and Americans who persuaded themselves that paying for these honorifics will somehow elevate their status. And I'm happy to say that I understand that uh, this practice has now ceased. There was for a while an order of the Dragon of Annam, given not by the late emperor, but by a remote descendant of the Vietnamese imperial house, whose claim to the grand mastership of the order was entirely without merit. The prince was later unmasked, but in the meanwhile he created an American gentleman who had no connection to Vietnam, grand chancellor, and <coughs> conferred upon him the title of Marquis. It seems that some time later, when both Pretender and Marquis had been unmasked, the real proud prince was persuaded to take up the title. He is now dead, and his heir seems to have lost interest in the conferral of titles. The first and most obvious question is, what is the real value of titles that can never be publicly recognized? In the case of those granted by the generally acknowledged claimant to the headship of the Russian imperial house, one may observe that these at least were granted according to the nobiliary tradition established by Peter the Great in the early 18th century. Even though, even though there may be little prospect of restoration or official state recognition, at least one of these titles has been recognized by the Order Malta. The same may be said of titles granted or recognized by King Umberto or King Francesco II. While the heirs of the extant Georgian titles may have a sentimental attachment to this history, none are believed to use the titles. In the Georgian and Rwandan cases, however, the, grant of these t the grantors are relatively unknown. The countries of which they claim to be the heir had no comparable tradition of Western-style nobility. They have little, if any, prospect of restoration. And it is exceedingly unlikely that the Spaniards or British and Americans who seem to be in charge of these awards would ever be accepted by the citizens of Georgia or Rwanda in any, any official capacity. The proposition that the title of Duke of San Jorge, as Mr. Escudero, y Diaz de Diaz Madonero styles himself, could somehow place him on himself on the level of a Spanish duke and grandee is laughable, and that William Charnley, the Duke of Amer, might imagine himself the equal of the Dukes of Devonshire or Northumberland is idiotic. The same criteria would apply to titles emanating from Southeast Asia, which aside from Japan had no compatible system of hereditary noble, noble titles to Western Europe. And on this screen you'll see, I'm afraid, an embarrassing incident uh, in Great Britain where during the absence of Her Majesty's private secretary and an incompetent uh, official in the British Foreign Office, um, the, uh, His Royal Highness the Duke of Gloucester was persuaded to accept a delegation led by Prince David, the Duke of San Jorge, and a tiny little man on the left uh, to be, give the collar of the or Georgian eagle uh, to the Duke, to Duke of Gloucester to accept on behalf of Her Majesty the Queen. He used to say Her Majesty the Queen knew nothing about this and it is not included among the honours that she uh, is listed as having. However, it did provide this... Um, uh, the financial operation of the Bagration orders, the opportunity to list Her Majesty among the recipients, which I suppose has brought new candidates. Those who know nothing about nobility will understand that these titles are worthless. And actually, I include here, by the way, just a thing about that these two images of the uh, Rwandan orders earlier this was. And you can see there seems to be some confusion about even how to wear their Grand Cross ribbons um, with a little fellow in red here um, his name is Addington, I believe, uh, clearly puzzled by the chap on his side. And then on the other picture, you'll see they wear their blue ribbons on different sides. It doesn't seem to matter as long as they have them. Those who know anything about nobility will understand that these titles are worthless. 
and indeed merely give rise to questions over the good judgment or even integrity of anyone who would consider paying for such honours or even accept them. Whatever one's sympathies for those unfortunates who believe that their new titles have elevated their studio status, I would offer only caveat emptor as words of comfort. Thank you. Thank you very much. Do eh? you have any question? Some question? Nothing? Okay. Okay. <laughs> Thank you very much. Okay. Now we take this off.